The fleet of the German Empire at the beginning of the 20th century became one of the largest and most modern in the world, helped by the imperial ambitions and naval enthusiasm of Kaiser Wilhelm II. By 1914, the Imperial Navy became the second largest after the British, ahead of the Russian and American fleets. Its increase challenged Great Britain as the leading maritime power and led to a German-British naval arms race that eventually contributed to the outbreak of the First World War. The main battles at the sea from 1914 to 1918 were conducted between these two countries. The Imperial Navy arose from the North German Confederations fleet, which was initially formed from the Prussian fleet, as the other states of the Confederation did not have their own naval forces. The commander-in-chief of the fleet was the Kaiser himself. In the unification wars of 1866 and 1871, the fleet did not play a significant role, but in subsequent years its importance grew following the Empire's needs. Initially its main task was the protection of the coast and German trade routes. Foreign naval bases were also founded with Germany's entry into colonial race. In addition to the strongholds in German colonies in Cameroon, East Africa and New Guinea, there were bases in China in the city of Qingdao, as well as in Constantinople. The main military ports of the metropolis were Kiel on the Baltic Sea and Wilhelmshaven on the North Sea. In 1895, under Wilhelm II, a canal was built that connected both seas. For the Emperor, the fleet has always remained his favorite brainchild. As a relative of the British royal family, the Kaiser was closely associated with Britain from an early age. He was jealous of its dominance at sea and made every effort to impose competition on London. The building of new ships and the propaganda associated with it led on the one hand to an aggravation of relations between these two countries, but on the other hand to a great surge of interest in the fleet in Germany. The naval officer career became prestigious, and boys across the country were dressed in sailor suits, although before Wilhelm II, Germany had never been a maritime power. The rapid development of technology and industry led to an introduction of new weapon systems. Although in this case it's hard to say which was more primary, technological progress itself or the needs of the army which accelerated it. Naval mines, torpedoes, submarines and naval aviation with airplanes and airships appeared. The defeat of the Russian fleet by the Japanese in the Battle of Tsushima in 1905 made clear that new naval tactics were required. From then on, large caliber guns would play a key role, as well as the ability of a quick maneuver. Britain's construction of the Dreadnought battleship in 1906 was a real shipbuilding revolution. Her name was then used to refer to a new ship type. Battleships of the old class were equipped with a set of guns of various calibers, from large to small. A feature of the Dreadnought was the rejection of medium and small caliber guns for the sake of more large caliber ones. This battleship was equipped with 10 305mm guns and had a high speed of 21 knots, giving it advantages over all previously released ships. Of course, it was impossible to completely switch to ships of this type in the eight years that remained before the start of the First World War. By 1914, the German fleet had 14 dreadnoughts against 21 in Britain. But the appearance of this ship, in any case, became the next stage of the arms race and set a new standard for military shipbuilding. The core of the Empire's naval forces was the so-called High Seas Fleet, based in Wilhelmshaven. This was its strength at the beginning of the First World War. 14 dreadnoughts, 22 pre-dreadnought battleships, 8 coastal defense ships, 11 so-called large cruisers, which included 4 battle cruisers and 7 armored ones, 12 light cruisers, 89 destroyers and 19 submarines. The battleships and coastal defense ships were divided into 6 squadrons, of 7 to 8 ships each, and the cruisers made up 5 reconnaissance groups. The fleet's flagship was the battleship Frederick the Great, 172 meters long. For comparison, the Titanic was 269 meters long. Also, two more large cruisers and three battleships were built during the war, including the new flagship Baden. The German fleet was represented in the Eastern Mediterranean by only two cruisers. After the First World War outbreak, they were transferred to the Ottoman Empire. 
the battlecruiser Goben remained the flagship of the Turkish fleet until 1950 and was cut into metal only in 1973. The East Asia Squadron, based in Qingdao, consisted of two large and two light cruisers. After the war's outbreak, Japanese troops landed in China and laid siege to Qingdao. As a result, the squadron under the command of Vice Admiral von Spee tried to break into Germany, bypassing South America. In the Pacific, they were joined by two more cruisers coming from the Atlantic. Off the Chilean coast on November 1, 1914, the squadron sank two British armored cruisers, but on December 8, off the Falkland Islands, it was defeated by the superior forces of the Royal Navy. Four cruisers were sunk, and only the Dresden ship managed to escape. The British also destroyed her in the spring of 1915 off the coast of Chile. Another cruiser of the East Asian squadron, Emden, became much more famous. Her captain von Müller decided not to follow everyone towards South America, but instead went to the Indian Ocean. Acting alone, Emden achieved outstanding successes. She captured 23 enemy merchant ships, shelled the port of Madras, causing a fire in an oil storage facility, and sunk a Russian cruiser and a French destroyer in the Strait of Malacca. In a combat with an Australian cruiser of Cocos Island, Emden was sunk on the November 9, 1914, but Captain von Müller survived and was captured. He returned to Germany after the war's end. Let's return to the main forces of the German fleet in the North Sea. The first significant naval battle between heavy British and German formations took place in August 1914 near Wilhelmshaven. It ended for Germany in defeat and the loss of three light cruisers and one destroyer, while Britain did not lose a single ship. This failure forced the leadership of the German fleet to exercise caution in offensive measures. The Royal Navy also avoided a direct confrontation since it was not strategically necessary and, moreover, in Britain they feared their own unnecessary losses. Instead, Britain became a blockade of the entire North Sea to cut off Germany from foreign supplies of goods and food. As a result, after the East Asian Squadron's destruction, the main German fleet was locked in its harbour. Only the two light cruisers, Karlsruhe and Königsberg, located in America and East Africa, had a certain freedom of movement. Karlsruhe at first acted quite successfully. She captured 17 merchant ships in the Atlantic Ocean. But already on November 4, 1914, she sank due to an explosion on board, the causes of which could not be established. In September, Königsberg sank the British cruiser Pegasus near the island of Zanzibar. After that, she went to a rival delta in Tanzania for repairs, where she was then found and destroyed by British ships. During these events, the situation in the North Sea did not change. The main forces of the British Navy, the Grand Fleet, were based off the coast of Scotland in the harbour of Scapa Flow. The German naval command planned to use provocative offensives to lure out some of the British ships and destroy them. Practically all the main actions of the High Seas Fleet were reduced to such attempts. In January 1915 a new offensive was launched, which again ended the German defeat at the Battle of Doggerbank, a large sandbank in the North Sea. This sortie involved two reconnaissance groups consisting of 8 cruisers and 18 destroyers. The armored cruiser Blucher was lost, while the British ships could not be sunk. One of the few successes of the German Navy in the first phase of the war was the sinking of three British armored cruisers. They were attacked off the Dutch coast by the submarine U-9 in September 1914. The operation was so successful because at this time submarines were a new weapon that was not expected to do so much damage. British crews at first perceived the heat of torpedoes on the first cruiser as explosions of naval mines. The other two ships stopped to save the staff of the damaged cruiser and thus became an easy target for the submarine. U-9 commander Otto Wedigen was declared a war hero and the submarines were presented as the new wonder weapon against the British blockade. Already at this early stage, the low efficiency of the high seas fleet became apparent. A huge mass of heavily armed ships was idle without the ability to break through the blockade. 
So in February 1915, the German leadership decided to wage an unlimited submarine war in the combat zone around Great Britain. Every ship, enemy or neutral, was now attacked without warning. In May, the British passenger liner Lusitania was sunk by a German submarine, with far-reaching consequences. Nearly 1200 people died then, including 128 US citizens. On the one hand, massive international protests forced the German leadership to stop unrestricted submarine warfare. On the other hand, this event pushed the formerly neutral United States into the camp of Germany's opponents. The High Seas Fleet finally got the opportunity to somehow influence the course of the war in the spring of 1916. Reconnaissance using new weapon types, such as airplanes and airships, usually outpaced the actions of large naval units preventing them from meeting in open battle. However, at the end of May 1916, due to weather conditions, aerial reconnaissance was complicated, and it was then that the most significant naval battle of the First World War took place. Almost the entire High Seas Fleet under the command of Admiral Scheer and the British Grand Fleet under the command of Admiral Jellicoe participated in it. The battle occurred near the Danish peninsula of Jutland on May 31st. More than 200 ships were involved in it. Initially, the High Seas Fleet intended to lure out and destroy part of the Grand Fleet, following the usual tactics. The Germans planned to lure battlecruiser squadron of Vice Admiral David Beatty towards the High Seas Fleet, which had left Wilhelmshaven and followed the Vanguard. Submarines were placed on the planned route in advance. However, the British intelligence service became aware of these plans so on May 30th, Jellicoe led the Grand Fleet toward British ships. On the afternoon of May 31st, Beatty stumbled upon Hipper's battlecruisers. In the ensuing battle, Hipper successfully brought the British ships into the path of High Seas Fleet. When Beatty spotted the large enemy force and turned towards the main British fleet, he had lost two of his six battlecruisers. Pursuing the remaining ships, the High Seas Fleet encountered the Grand Fleet on the same day's evening. In the heated battle, Jellicoe tried to maneuver to cut off the Germans from their base, while Scheer attempted to find an opportunity to retreat. The active phase of the battle lasted around 90 minutes. 14 British and 11 German ships were sunk in the strike exchange, for a total death toll of almost 10,000. Finally, the onset of darkness helped Scheer break away from the British fleet and return to Wilhelmshaven. The outcome of the battle was ambiguous. The British suffered greater losses in men and ships, although they had a numerical advantage on their side. The success of the German fleet was essentially only that it didn't lose. The battle did not change the strategic situation. The Royal Navy was able to maintain a naval blockade until the end of the war as the German High Seas Fleet no longer ventured into such large-scale battles. The uncertain outcome of the fight finally proved the low importance of expensive large ships and again turned the attention of the German military command to submarines. On February 1, 1917, Germany again began unrestricted submarine warfare. The Allies, for their part, grouped merchant ships across the Atlantic into sea convoys to better counter the threat. When the war was finally lost in the fall of 1918, the Imperial Navy planned to take on the Grand Fleet in one last major battle. The British Navy by that time was at the peak of its power. It consisted of 30 dreadnoughts and 11 battle cruisers against respectively 18 and 5 in Germany. The proposed battle would have been purely symbolic of preserving the honor of the naval forces. But the hopelessness of such an initiative was clear to the German sailors. The protest culminated in an uprising of the Kiel sailors. This in turn became the starting point of the November Revolution, which ended the German Empire. After the end of hostilities, the High Seas Fleet was escorted to Scapa Flow by the terms of armistice. The ships were there for six months, while their fate was being decided. In the summer of 1919, the terms of Versailles Treaty became known. Following them, a significant part of the fleet had to be transferred to the Allies. Refusing to comply, Rear Admiral von Reuter ordered the sinking of the ships. 
Most of the sailors by this time had already left the ships and returned to Germany. Still, there were casualties. Nine crew members were killed by the British trying to prevent the flooding. In Germany, this decision was received with enthusiasm. Von Reuter was greeted as a hero upon his return from captivity. Later, the British raised most of the ships and cut them into metal. But some, including three battleships, remained at the bottom of the bay.